Life is made up of moments. Some great ones, some terrible ones. Moments make up the man or woman. What do you do to prepare for that? What do you do when it has arrived? What do you do when it has passed? You don't make the moments. The moments make you. This is the Mwamba Moments. Welcome back to another segment of the Mwamba Moment. And today we are with the most gracious Grace Mahari. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for doing this, Grace. Thank you for having me. I'm a huge fan of your work. Stop it. Friends. Stop it. I'm a fan. But let's get into this. Let's get into okay. your journey because I know that for the little bit of time that we've known each other and obviously you know the relate the way i know you through my lovely wife i've heard a lot shout about you jess. shout out to jess <laughs> heard a lot about you know a lot about you hold on first of all let's go through the way we actually first met right, right? in the right. middle of new york yes right and i was walking one way yep. i knew what you looked like you knew what i looked like right <laughs> and we were kind of like, wait a second, double take. Is that? Oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> like in the movies, really. Yes. But, um, yeah, so I know a little bit about you, but I really want to take those lessons out so that people can just learn from it. I, I, I just, before we even start about on, on your journey, I want to talk about um, before everything started, right? What are some other passions of yours? Oh. A, a little birdie told me. Something about basketball, but oh, yeah. I might have to put that to the test. I mean, so that the people know, uh, I knew about you through Jess for, I mean, from the day she met you. Right, right, right. Which was like, you know, not to date myself, but to date myself like, at least <laughs> 10 years ago. And uh, we were in school uh, at the time. Uh, I was at the University of Toronto, and we were both in this kinesiology program. And she had met this, you know, football player who was playing out east. And I was like, girl, you need to be careful because, <laughs> you know, even though he may be like the guy you think he's great now, like, who knows? And that was me at 20 or 19 trying to give, like, Go whatever advice that I had <laughs> in, with no experience or whatever. But, um, you know, and I heard all these great things. And obviously, you turned out to be an amazing dude. Oh, and, thank you. Uh, and you were engaged and then we saw each other in the street and I was like, holy moly, I'm so happy to see this person. <laughs> um, and all that's to you know, go back into my, my world. I definitely was a, an avid basketball player. I loved sports growing up. I was born in Edmonton and then I moved to Toronto to play basketball and to model at the same so, time. So, so, so when you're on the court, like, what, what's, what's, what's the nickname for Grace? What are the names that they used to give you? Stretch. G money. Okay. Uh, G money. I had a nice baseline shot. All right. No, uh, I don't have that much right now. But at the time, there was that. I, I forget some other. Just, yeah. Did you ever? Did you ever want to like? Mahari. Did you? <laughs> okay. Did you ever have any aspirations of going pro or anything like that, oh, or was yeah. it just like I'm just doing this for fun? No, I, I mean growing up in, in, I mean anywhere in Canada at the time, like in the '90s and early 2000s. You you aspire to go play professional or college sports in America. Like that was the dream. And I was like hell bent on getting a scholarship to go to a D1 school, you know, and then I was hoping to get a free ride to, to any pharmacy or like doctor to become a doctor of some sort. Um, but life happens and things change. Okay, look. This is a one-time opportunity I'm going to give you, right? Mm -hmm. Because that's actually one of the cool things that happens when you you turn pro. You kind of get to do, you know, you, you got cameras on you, you know, TV deals. So you got to do these commercials and like, right. hey, you say your name, you say the school you went to, your position, mm -hmm. and you got oh! a chance to do that right here, right now. Your only chance to feel like a pro basketball player. Your name, your school, your position. Camera's right there. Hi, my name is Grace. That's so awkward. Like, I don't even know how to. Okay. Hey, what's up? I'm Grace Mahari. I am the small forward for the New York Liberty, and I can't wait for us to win the championship this year. <laughs> that works. That works just fine. All right, so you went to University of Toronto. I did. Right? And I want to go um, to the very beginning of everything. First of all. Okay. Getting in there, I know how hard it is, but you're in there, right? right. You get to U of T, mm -hmm. and um, 
T take me there at that very moment. You're, you're at Toronto. So I'll take you back actually to Alberta because that's where the basketball seeds were planted. Um, growing up watching, you know, Chicago, the Chicago Bulls win the series. And I, I think I was really fortunate to be able to make it to this amazing basketball program at the time led by Ron Cooney. And that coach over there taught me so much, not just on the court, but off the court. Mm -hmm. um, the discipline that I learned in that program, and I was only there for a year, but the years before that in junior high, I, I was training to get into that program. Um, but yeah, the rules that we learned on the court transferred anywhere as well. So when I moved to Toronto, I wasn't really sure what the league was like. I thought it was a whole different style of playing basketball too on the East Coast than it is in the Prairies or the West Coast. Um, so I, I really had to figure out, do I want to do this? Because I learned quickly, you know, trying to model, trying to play basketball and trying to be a great student all at the same time was really challenging. Um, so, and I learned really quickly that you can't expect 100% rewards when you're only giving 50% energy oh, or effort. Come on. So, I decided to take some time off of modeling, and that's when I, I made the decision to try out for the U of T basketball team. Um, because, you know, during high school, I kind of had to put basketball to the side in order for me to at least pass at this point. I went from an honor student to like almost just barely passing because right. I was trying to model as well and make it work. Um, so that that next step, you know, going onto the court and realizing that I, I wasn't as good as I used to be, but I still had every uh, intention to make this team and play basketball. It was really, it was a challenge. Mm, I love it, I love it. Uh, I always try to kind of pinpoint the foundation of certain successful individuals, and it's interesting that yours comes from uh, a basketball background, really. So now you're, you're at the school, and, and I want you to take us through that moment. And I know how to kind of that transition from you leaving Canada and coming back and leaving for good and, and kind of, you know, taking on after your dreams, but take us to that moment and what that period in your life was like. So, I mean, I played for a year at University of Toronto and University of Toronto is not known for their basketball team, I won't say sports, but they're definitely known for their academics. Um, so there was a lot of like of my pride and ego that I had to just let go because I wasn't, I was a red shirt. I didn't get many, many minutes. Um, and I think just in that year I learned to I was trying, let's say, because I, I think you're always learning this, to not be so hard on yourself. Because mm -hmm. as an athlete, you get it, especially in team sports, you're like getting it from everybody left, right, and center. Um, but also on your own, you're, you need to just let yourself um, fail and learn from those moments. So it was, a, it was a very inquisitive year. And there was a specific moment that I got injured in the face from another teammate that I decided then and there I should try this modeling thing before it's too late, before all this and whatever I needed to get there was gone. Uh, so that's how that, that kind of switched. I, I decided I was gonna defer, at the time I thought one year of school and Jess and our, my friends at the time can attest to you know my stubbornness and saying like, I'm just gonna do this thing for a year full time and then I'll come back and, and that'll be that. 10 years later, I am still modeling, I have a nonprofit, I, I became a certified sommelier, and I am still an avid basketball fan. Awesome, awesome. And, and it's, it's amazing. Being in that industry, right? Aesthetics, beauty. Talk to me about the role of just beauty in society. Mm. Mm. That's a really... That's a, that's a tough question to answer sh Very in, in, in short. Yeah. Yes. Um, because I will say, you know, what beauty in society meant to me was traumatizing. Mm. Growing up in, you know, really white neighborhoods or just Alberta and Edmonton was, was very white. And I didn't see myself in my school and my communities other than like the Eritrean parties my mom would take us to. <laughs> So, and even there, you're like an alien just trying to figure out who are we in this, uh, in this world. So when you don't see yourself in those circles and when you don't see yourself in the media, yeah. it's hard to understand what beauty really means. Yes. So only when I went to Toronto, I really started understanding, oh, like I can wear my hair natural and out. I don't got to press my hair. I don't need to like 
lighten my skin for anyone all these things that it's, it's, it was an evolution for me to understand what beauty is mm, mm. so uh, then in your profession where beauty really matters right mm. you're talking about how basketball almost <laughs> you're like you know what before that basketball takes everything away let, let me try this thing out full on right beauty yeah. matters in yeah. in your industry so can you tell us then how do you what exactly do you do to kind of stay grounded to to keep and, and remain and keep your identity right and and I, i'm assuming it's not that easy well i thought you were gonna ask me how do you stay beautiful I'm be like, what? <laughs> well that too Dang, you can go on with that i lost it it's all gone no uh but th that's actually for me beauty has always been tied to what's inside mm. as corny as and cliche is that i like that i uh, know but i'm not joking because now in 2020 people are t taking they're like we're not taking the assholes we mm. don't have to work with the assholes mm. and it's so fun and glorious mm. now because i'm like great let let's let the good people win and like shine light on that type of beauty because that to me is going to be more everlasting and sustainable than your cute lips or nose for one season mm. you know and don't get me started on our natural features and what has been taken or if we get there we get there. <laughs> we get there um okay um so you take that leap of faith hmm. right talk to me i think you, you you were mentioning to myself and my wife in the past um in conversations about how that process was Mm -hmm. And I think that there's a huge misconception, I think, in your industry where, you know, people feel like, hey, if you're a model, all you got to do is wake up and, you know, the work is done. But I really want to hear, first of all, those challenges that you kind of experienced at the beginning stages. And then also um, talk to me about those and I'll ask you the follow up, the follow up question. So there's the general, you know, challenges that models face, which unfortunately is you're constantly being criticized for the way that you look mm. and you're not supposed to take that personally because it's just about an image that people are trying to create but it's hard because there there's there's no filter mm. there are no filters in the way that people talk about you um and they're unfortunately and you can't control that no you can't control that and there are things about you know like sexual abuse and, and taking advantage of, of models that mm. those numbers are very real in the industry. And if you're younger going into it or maybe older, you feel like you have to comply with whatever is happening, of course. unfortunately. Um, so I'm really grateful I, I took the time and started professionally at 20, 21 versus at 16, 15, 14 when they were asking me to walk internationally. And I was like, this is, I can, you know, I just, I'm grateful for the time that I took. Um, and then there are the challenges that happen within race, within size, within age, within class. You know, I, I don't even know where to start with that, but I can speak at least to my experience. I'm being a person of color in the industry. I had all the blue chip bookings or I had all the like, requirements for what it technically, you know, be the right recipe to be a supermodel. Mm -hmm. And it still didn't work for years because Again, there's issues in the industry with race, size, age, class, all of those things. Mm. Um, so your personal challenges, once you left Canada and you said, this is what I'm doing, mm -hmm. I am following my dreams, I'm foregoing University of Toronto, and um, this is what I want. Sorry, Dad. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know what? To be honest, the biggest challenge was and it still is to this day at a much less uh, scale or size, was accepting that I am a model mm. and that the definition of a model isn't this one like basic, oh, she's stupid and she just kind of takes pictures for a living. You know, there's so much more to this. Um, I think modeling is a great vehicle for whatever you want to do in your life. And it has afforded me a lifestyle that I never thought I would have had otherwise. Mm -hmm. uh, so my challenge was, was accepting that. Um, and then the more literal or not so metaphoric challenges were, you know, letting people t see my natural hair and, and leaving me alone and like booking me with that, you know, being able to sit down in a chair and, and not have 
people make my make me gray, have my skin tone. Like, come on, you know. There are also po politics and things that people don't want to talk about openly, or they'll say things and we're supposed to just brush it off. Um, I'll use the example in sports where they say stick to sports. Mm. Well, I'm not sticking to modeling. I'm not right. going to just shut up and take a picture or shut up and be, you know, on film. If you are doing something wrong, I'm going to say something. Right. I had a makeup artist who wanted to make me look like um, Tyra Banks for this one. Like we were doing a GIF or a meme GIF. I don't know how to say that thing. <laughs> me neither. I'm not going to You were not going to do that. <laughs> but I know exactly what you're talking about. Yeah. And so... For some reason, they needed me to be the exact same skin tone as her, and I guess I was just lighter, you know, from not being in the sun. God bless Canada, New York, all these cold places. And they just kept going back and putting more and more powder and just like putting like, and I was like, hey, you know, I don't want to be the difficult model, but I'm like, I don't think this is fair. I don't want to be, you're not going to blackface me. Like, what the hell? This yeah. doesn't even make sense. Like, yeah. I, I, yeah, it just, things like that, that always came up and I, I've always had to question, can I say something? Right, right, right. This is uh, extremely interesting to me, especially, and again, this is a extremely foreign industry to me, but I already oh, hear a lot of- Oh, you get your modeling on, you good. Stop, 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 <laughs> come on, man, listen. But, listen, my uh, the question that comes to mind really is because I, I feel like all the challenges that you've been talking about and, and the things that you're mentioning as far as your industry is concerned, um, did you ever get to a point where you know, you started questioning yourself. Like, am I really myself? Am I just changing? Like, what? I'm really talking about your identity. Did you ever have any issues? And how did how did the whole modeling thing affect your regular life? And if I were to even make it even clearer, my question is really asking: um, How do you separate Grace Mahari, the human being, Grace Mahari, the model? That's so funny. Um, just because I have brothers who keep me very humble. <laughs> Good. <laughs> so I think I just growing up in that family where you ain't shit. Like that, that was, and it was funny. It was right. fine. I don't, you know, I, I love the, you know, highs and lows. And, and I still kind of do that with how I dress, where, where I go, where I roll, because that's life, you know, it's a, it's a mixture of these things. Um, so, yeah, I guess that's how I separate. I don't know if I, I just, it's just me. It's not, I don't know, you can ask, you can ask Jess to say like, I don't think I've changed who I am as a person in this time. She's definitely always said that. Other people have changed the way they see me, mm -hmm. which I guess is part of like the limelight and Hollywood or whatever the case may be, or selling this like fantasy. But I really don't feel any different. I feel maybe wiser. Mm. Uh, but I've always wanted to treat people how I want to be treated, if not better, because I come from a family of we've had, you know, we have disability and we have our heartbreaks and just all these things that I feel like life is already so hard. Why not just go out there and give people your best and to give them the best experience? I love that. I love that. Um, you talked about how you know, specifically in your industry, a lot of it has to do with people kind of looking at you and judging you and, and from the outside. But what would you say then, right, is the biggest misconception about modeling? Uh, the biggest misconception about modeling is that it's all glamorous mm -hmm. and all you have to do is just take pictures. Um, there's a lot of work behind it, uh, but I, you know, there are so many jobs out there that are difficult. Um, so just like, you know, in your job and your day to day, there are things you hate about it and things you may love about it. It's the same thing in, in modeling. Mm -hmm. So I'd like to um, actually even get into in, in that saturated industry, right? That's extremely competitive mm -hmm. and i'm and i'm interesting to really ask this question especially with your your you know your background in basketball and and how you know competitive the sport is period right. but what do you what what do you do in your industry to kind of um separate yourself and distance yourself from the competition quote unquote so i came into this modeling industry not wanting to model okay so i think that helps um, uh, in conjunction with having other 
passions and goals. Mm -hmm. So, you know, no knocking or no offense to anyone that has, you know, dreams to become the most successful or just a successful model. My goal was never that. It was always to use this as a vehicle to do other things. And the first thing, you know, leaving school was, oh my God, I'm going to be able to see the world so much faster than I will had I gone the different route. Mm -hmm. um, and that, again, that's not to knock anyone for what choices they make of or what course. routes they make. But for me, that has always been the goal to, to you know, model, but let leverage it for the things that you also are interested in. I love it. I love it. And, and you're basically talking about growth, internal growth, right? And it's interesting right. because, um, you know, you talked about, I didn't really change much, but, you know, I feel like I got wiser. So it's internal growth, right? It's evolution. And, and I think it's so important in everything. But uh, how do you feel, right? Your internal growth has affected your, your overall life. Um, like, what about when, when, when people see you? And, and they point to you, right? How, how do you define the internal embellishment? So, you know, internal growth is definitely top, 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 top on my list of priorities. Okay. Um, I'm always trying to challenge myself. And, you know, this industry, because there's so, there are so many factors that, that, that affect your self-esteem, it was like pff, clockwork, you know, starting at the age of 16, like people are already telling you something's wrong. So what are you doing to better yourself so that you're not taking in that energy and giving out negative energy? Mm -hmm. I'm a firm believer in, 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 in like karma and energy. And so I'm always trying to just understand how to repurpose energy, which is, I guess, a nice pun because now I work with clean energy and <laughs> <laughs> my nonprofit. But you know, the, the there are so many people that just stay complacent and including myself. Like I've definitely, human nature is to stay complacent and my goal is to always challenge that. Okay, here's where we are. And not in like a, okay, you're not doing enough, but more so like, are you cool? Are you okay with what's happening? And are you, can you take yourself out of, can I take myself out of my body and see what's happening mm. and not judge it, you know, because You'll never be able to control what people think of you, but you can definitely reassess the situation for yourself. Absolutely. You can definitely like that's where I can I can change and like welcome that that growth. That's awesome. That's awesome. Um what would you say then is your was your biggest because you had an amazing journey. You've learned a lot and you seem to continuously, you know, strive to grow, strive to learn more. What is the biggest lesson you think? Um, as far as transferable skill, transferable lesson that you've learned in, you know, modeling that you feel like, man, like I apply this on my day to day. It's kind of something my dad always used to say. He would just say like, he would say, keep it simple. And he would say, take it easy. Mm. It was like T-I-E, take it easy. And I realized in sports, I'm not taking anything easy. Like I'm trying to gun it in school. I'm like, okay, I need to, may, I may or may not have been cramming at night, but I was still <laughs> gunning it. And I was like, okay, I need to make sure I, you know, get this done. I'm paying for this. Like we need to make sure you have a future in this. But with modeling, I realized like, okay, you can gun it, but you can also take it easy. Like you can just do your best and then just let it happen. And so that has been helpful going into new projects um, overseas with my nonprofit or going into a very intensive uh, sommelier training, going into all these things and realizing you need, to, you need to just take it easy because I have a personality where I really go ham and mm -hmm. it has been super helpful to just chill out for a second and let life take its course. Awesome. Um, greatest challenge that you yourself you felt like had to overcome to be right here with us today mm. oh that's a good question i i would say you know leaving home at 16 mm -hmm. but i wouldn't say that was a challenge because i mean i like challenges and if it's i don't i don't want to sound obnoxious but i, I actually there are challenges that i 
I look forward to. Of course. And I learned at an early age, like if you don't like something, you're never gonna get good at it. So change your attitude about it. Like Absolutely. I, you know, if you, I did not like social studies or history, which now I love, but at the time I just wanted to do math, science, and just get things that made, you know, formulas make sense. Um, and I realized you need to change your perspective on this. It's not so bad. Think about things that you can use this with in your life. And that's what helped me move forward in, in that space. So when I think about moving at 16, I saw it as a challenge. I definitely, I was definitely devastated crying to my coach at the time, telling him I'm leaving Edmonton, I'm leaving all my friends and going to a new city. But it was also one of the most exciting and exhilarating challenges or moments of my, my life. Um, take it easy. Embrace challenges. I love that because so many people sell themselves short because they run from these challenges that right. could take them over the hump, that could take them to another level, right. right? What is it outside of those two things? Young girls watching, Eritrean, of all colors, <laughs> all sizes, <laughs> right? But, you know, any young girl watching and saying, man, I love that girl, Grace Aww. Mahari, she's amazing. First of all, thank you, I love you more, because <laughs> I'm here because of you, and you pushing me out there like that. <laughs> I want to be like her. What's your best, what's the best advice you would give them? Ooh, well, specifically, the Eritrean girls out there, and I think the Eritrean generation now that's coming out already has this, but, like, Gen Z does is to challenge the reserved perspectives that we were raised in. Mm. There are a lot of things that, you know, culture brings you, but there are a lot of things that culture restrains you from doing. Um, so I would say like you, I love the word embrace that you said about challenges. Embrace those challenges, but also recognize the fear and where it's coming from. Mm. And then work with that fear because that's still energy and see where you can go with that. Ask yourself the questions of why is this so fearful? Because then I started realizing, oh, is this me or is this because of how I grew up? Is this me or is this the community that's going to judge me? You know? So oh, I, I love what you're saying. Like, this is very deep. And you think you're talking just to Richard and girls. I'm not talking to Richard. Well, you're talking, talking to everybody. To, yeah, everyone has right? I, I, I brought, I, you know, I kind of, you know, talked about young girls. But really, right. this is everybody. And I know right. for a fact, because I can relate. Uh, people say, man, you know, you're playing football and you play linebacker, which is a very physical position. But right. um, I know you don't know the position. I understand but, a few things. Right. Football. But, uh, you know, it's such a physical <laughs> position. But, like, when I first started playing, I was extremely afraid of contact, right. right? And I love when you talked about even fear is energy that you can use to your advantage, right? Because I remember I was afraid of contact. Mm -hmm. I didn't want to get hit. And I was a running back, so I held the ball and I was supposed to score touchdowns. Right. I didn't understand the rules, didn't understand anything. So they told me, hey, look, just go score a touchdown. I was running in fear, right? right? The first success that I experienced in football was just in fear. Right, and once you hone in on that fear, yo, you're unstoppable. Like you really can't like all the rules in life that you learn don't apply to you anymore. Cause you're 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 literally unstoppable. You know, there are so many fears. Oh man, life brings you so so much worry, so much stress. And if you can just start looking at why are you scared of that? Is it because, you know, X, Y, and Z? Oh, okay, so what can we do with that? Mm. So and um, now you're like Running around, people training, training our little cousins, <laughs> showing them the work. So, so uh, I, I, I just think it's such a such a valuable lesson, an amazing lesson as well for everyone to hold on to. Right. Um, but while we're on the topic, okay, Grace Mahar, I know you're a superwoman. I know you've done all this. You've conquered all these mountains. Oh, but man. what would you say was then your greatest fear? Oh, my greatest fear has, I mean, has always been to fail. Mm. And just recently, you know, I realized failing has been so helpful and I need to fall on my face. You know, the la like it was like just before I started Project Zahai, I was mm -hmm. like very fearful, you know, and, and especially launching in Eritrea where it's actually really difficult to work in. in uh, it's it's it was mind blowing at how much I stressed over the whole thing. And now looking back, I'm like, you need to fail in order for you to go on. Amazing. If you are not failing, you are not progressing. There's no growth. And unfortunately, we live in a society where a lot of very powerful people don't 
recognize or acknowledge they've failed or their wrongs and they just hot, like sweep it under the rug, which is toxic for people. It was very toxic for, for, for people to grow up seeing that, no, you're perfect and I'm strong and I'm always, do-. that. that is, you know, for me, mm. the biggest, I think, lesson now and, and I, I just embellish or like smother myself in those failures. I'm like, ooh, let me humor this because well, one, he, laughter is the best medicine, but I two, it. if I can get over that, great. That's another step in the right direction. Now now I've conquered something and I'm gonna do it better than the last time. Mm, I love it, I love it. Um, so you, you mentioned it. It's, it's a project that you know I've been watching and supporting since the beginning. Thank you. Um, talk to us about it. Talk to us about Project Sahai and, and where it came from, how it originated, what it is, and because right. uh, it's extremely important. Yeah, no, it, it thank you. Um, I appreciate everyone that supports this. We are still a very small organization. I started Project Sahai, I mean, the conception or the idea was conceived, I think, in 2014, um, but it came to life uh, 2016, 2017. So I was visiting Eritrea first time as an adult, only time before that I was like four, don't remember much. It was for the independence. And my, you know, my experience going to Eritrea was, first of all, a huge like juxtaposition to where I was before. I was fresh off the like Parisian haute couture runways. <laughs> I pronounced that wrong. Haute couture, my French is great. Um, and I was so like excited by this, you know, new life that modeling afforded me. And then I was, you know, thinking like, okay, I, I can finally afford a ticket to go to Eritrea and I'm already in Paris or in France. I'm on this side of the world. So why not? So I went by myself. First of all, most Eritrean children or people go with their families as, you know, before they go in there uh, on their own. Um, I went on my own and I was very humbled because you just, first of all, you, everyone looks like you. Everyone's speaking to Grinia. Everyone's like, oh, wow. But then you're also not like them because you grew up in another uh, country. Um, so the second trip, I, I went back real, like really trying to, to create some kind of positive impact because I just knew that the way that they were living is not the way that we're living and mm. I don't see why they shouldn't be, we shouldn't have an equal playing field. Gotcha. Um, so I knew energy was an issue. I wasn't able to charge any of my devices while I was there. So without being a pre prima donna, I was like, how can we, you know, help? and. I still love the idea of an energy coin or some type of way to make energy more affordable and accessible um, and sustainable to our communities through digital coins or something that doesn't require them buying back the resources they've sold uh, to, to other countries. Another TED talk. <laughs> but I decided to start Project Sahai in that. So I, our goal is to provide clean energy solutions to communities that don't have electricity access. We started in Eritrea. We worked with the town called Ma'aya. We gave 105 solar panels. So 101 households got um, a solar panel battery and then instructions on how to care for this plus a tr the local church school and mosque we took that we went to tanzania we worked with the school there and provided them solar energy cut to 2020 the pandemic we couldn't go back to east africa so we've decided to work within america aligning ourselves with the black and brown communities that are fighting for equality in this country oh. amazing amazing and uh, I, I just pick up on small pieces that you're saying, you know, and it's just amazing how you continue to, because the way you increase your value is by solving problems that you've seen, right? And that's oh. what Project Sahai is doing. And just, I, we're almost done. Thank you, first of all, just for, you already had value, but you continuing to increase your value. And so, um, thank you. <laughs> and that you really take my run on words and sentences and turn them into beautiful things. So I hope that, you know, I, I appreciate that. Good. You got projects to high, you got modeling going on. You got a bunch of stuff. Talk to us about the wine stuff. Oh. You didn't even get into that. I didn't. Um, to keep it short, I, you know, again, everything I do is about leveling up the playing field and providing these luxurious, but also just like sweet moments to everyone. We should be able to enjoy good food, good wine. We should be able to have access to clean and sustainable energy solutions, sustainable clothing, fashion. So 
as I was traveling the world, doing these runway shows and, and, and dining and trying wine in different countries, the experience was so intimidating. I'd pick up a wine list and I just feel like I didn't belong. And I realized that, that that's not normal. And whether it's wine, food, or whatever the case may be, I see it happen all the time. Uh, so I took the clinical approach and drove myself or dove myself into a very theoretical way of studying about wine. Um, took off time last year from modeling three months to become a certified sommelier. And now my whole you know goal is to amplify people like us, our voices, because our, I mean, I'm sure in the Congo, they have their own form of some type of fermented drink. In Eritrea, we have um, what's, I mean, the mead in Eritrea is called uh, mess, which is honey wine. Mm -hmm. And then we have sua, which is our beer. So we've been fermenting things for like, forever. Why are we not afforded these great, you know, beverage experiences when we've been doing this from time? Also, we have phenomenal food, like our flavors all over the world, like in, in Asia, in Africa, in uh, South America. You know, South America has a, a booming wine industry in Asia as well. Um, obviously, parts of Af most of Africa, you can't grow grapes because they're conditions, but doesn't mean that our people around the world can enjoy. enjoy those. It. So that's where I am. Uh, and I hope that I get to bring some nice beverages for you next time. Oh, for sure. I should have asked you to bring some, huh? That's okay. But... You did ask me what you should bring. I should have said that. But listen, you, just talking to you, I'm, I'm seeing, it seems like you're an expert at starting new things. I mean, starting with the basketball, and then it was the modeling, Project Sahai, the wine. What would you say to this person that's out there, right? I want to be a doctor. I want to be a lawyer. I want to be an engineer. It's hard though, and it's new. What would you say to that person that's already in, uh, 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 already in an industry, already doing something in a profession, but afraid to take that leap mm. to start something new? You know, it goes back to discipline, and it goes back to also just understanding that failure, fail, failure will be a part of that. Mm. So once you can accept both, because it almost feels like people try. It, People treat them separately, like, okay, if I'm disciplined, then I'm never going to fail. Yes. No, it's it's totally part of it. So give, and when I say discipline, I mean, like, if that person is starting a new venture or is already in there, but they don't know if they should, just give yourself a, an allotted amount of time. Because if you don't, and if you don't try 100%, you'll never know. And that's why I feel like I mentioned earlier, yes. I didn't, I wouldn't have known if I could model if I was just going to be half-assing it. I wouldn't have known if I could become a psalm if I was just half-ass in it you know so for all of you out there no half-ass full ass full ass okay <laughs> all right we'll take that take that lesson straight from grace mahari Here we go. <laughs> but um just one thank you thank you grace for um for your time and um the lessons that you've learned we got to do this again another yeah. time and you you're bringing the wine that's right i'll bring the glasses perfect <laughs> I was expecting some food, but all right. I'm just all right, we'll do food. But um, thank you so much. Thank, thank you so you, much man. for your time, for just blessing us and honoring us in this other episode of the Muama Moment with Grace Mahari. <laughs>